Okay, so after the group picture, we will resume. And the first speaker of this afternoon's session is Victor Yonganil from the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics, but also the Ludwig Institute for Cancer Research and the University of Lausanne, where he teach. So he has three hats in a way. And you maybe can see in a picture, he says Einstein simplified on his t-shirt. <laughs> He is a microbiologist by training. He aids both the transcriptomic analysis and the vitality groups at the, of the SIB. You heard about the vitality group already a bit by Ernest. He was also for a long time heading the MNET node, the Swiss MNET node, for at least uh, 10 years now. Or, or no, 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 about four years. Oh, OK. Yeah. It seems no, yes, there was more. And he was a co-founder and the first director of the SIB. What happened is he got very early in his career interested in using computers to analyze sequence, and that led him to bioinformatics. No, as geographical links at Lausanne, where he is, no, but also Chapel Hill in San Francisco, where I think you studied. And as bio links happen all of the city, because everyone knows, I mean, Victor, everyone has worked with Victor, so many people have published papers with Victor's. And speaking of publishing papers, I'm privileged to have written a paper with Victor in 1989, and it was a paper, in fact, on a, a prosite pattern, and it came from an observation of Victor, which was working with Jacques Bouvier analyzing a Leishmania protease, and he came to me and said, seems to be some pattern conserved in those proteases, in other proteases which, which binds in, can you do a prosite pattern? I did one, and we published a small letter in uh, FEBS, where we showed all of those Protease at this now famous H E H motif, and there were a number of two, in fact, three proteins which have the motif where we didn't know what their function was. And the second one here is on this list is tetanus toxin. And we said in the conclusion, maybe those are proteins. We didn't want to say anything more. And three years later, the paper from Cesare Monte Cucco came out saying it's a zinc protease. And I spoke to him a little bit later, I mean, I think in 94, and he told me that he had never seen a paper, and that if he had, he would have gained one year. But at the time, you didn't, nobody had access really to search on Medline and so on, so a paper title didn't tell him anything, you know, on, zinc, on, uh, on tetanus toxin, so he lost one and a half year because he would have tested it before. And from what I know, it's, this paper has been cited a number, quite a number of times. Yeah, it's, it's one of our most cited papers. Hmm. So it's a long-lasting collaboration, and that's why I'm happy to welcome Victor to you. Okay, thank you very much, Amos. Uh, thanks for inviting me here. I hadn't been in Brazil for a while, and I really love this place, so I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I'm, going, I'm feeling very embarrassed because I'm coming after uh, Ron, who told you everything about the history of his collaboration with Amos in uh, a style that I could not even begin to uh, imitate. So just bear with me, I'll be dull, I'll be relatively uninteresting, but I hope that I'll be short. So that should be a saving grace. And what I'm trying to, what I'm gonna try to tell you is, okay, you, you have heard a lot about the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics, uh, we're sponsoring this meeting, and I'd like to get through to you more or less how we got to be where we are today. So this is, in a way, the prehistory of the SIP. Now, what many people forget is that not only is bioinformatics a relatively li uh, recent discipline, but it was a discipline that was formally forbidden for many years. Um, when I was in college, uh, this was 30, 35 years ago. I wanted to study computer science. The same thing happened with Manuel Paich. Um, and we were told this was absolutely out of the question. As biologists, we could not have access to computers. Philip Bucher, when he tried to do a PhD uh, in sequence analysis, was told, no way, you can't do that. And uh, I remember 
when I came back to Switzerland, a well-known scientist telling me, I don't need a computer, I just print out the sequence and I can find the restriction sites by hand, it's no problem. So, something wrong. But somehow, uh, many of us managed to get around this. I mean, Amos taught himself computer science, and he managed to convince his boss, Robin Offord, that actually bioinformatics is a legitimate field of study, even for biologists. Philip went abroad, he got trained with Ed Trifonov and Sam Carlin in more enlightened countries than Switzerland. Um, for myself, once I got to graduate school in Chapel Hill, I was able to take computer science courses as electives, uh, which also, they thought it was strange, but at least they did tell me I wasn't allowed to do it. Uh, Ron Apple came, uh, got his education as a computer scientist to begin with, and uh, Manuel Page actually also had to go abroad and he got trained in molecular modeling with uh, Jacob Maisel at uh, NCI. So, we had to begin somewhere. And Amos actually really started all this. And in 1982, he started a group called Bionet, which was basically a group of software pirates. I mean, he just got software from various sources, redistributed it, hacked it, and so forth. Uh, besides, of course, writing software himself. And when I arrived in Switzerland, the only place where one could do some sequence analysis was on a computer that was about 10 kilometers away that we had to connect to via modem and that didn't have any databases on it. It only had the software. So if you wanted to analyze a sequence, you had to type it in manually. Um, gradually, through the joint efforts actually of the, the members of this group, uh, we kind of pushed to introduce microcomputers in the labs. And uh, in 84, Amos released the first uh, version of basically his PhD thesis. I can't remember what the name of that first release was. It wasn't PC Gene yet. But uh, CompSec? No, there was something before CompSec. The very first release had a different name. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, so, you can see that the names that appear here are actually uh, people that are all in the room here. So this started a very long time ago. And one thing that one tends to forget is that just having access to infrastructure, not just education, was a real problem at the time. And again, obscurantism. There was no reason why biologists should have access to a mainframe computer. It was considered totally stupid and useless. And we needed access to, com to large computers for a number of reasons. We needed to keep local copies of sequence databases. We needed a CPU power. We needed software suites which were, uh, uh, which were able to search into these databases. And we needed access to the computer in order to maintain the software. And uh, for the first 20 years, it's been a constant battle to get access to the resources that we really needed and uh, I think it's only really very recently with uh, the start of the Vital IT Center that we finally have enough power that we can do the things that we really want to do. And just to give you a little bit of perspective, we tried for about 15 years to get access to the mainframe computer at the university, which was always denied. Uh, fortunately, we have institutes in Switzerland that are funded by industry, the Friedrich Mischer Institute, which had a good uh, infrastructure and they were kind enough to let us use it, but we still had to pay very steep fees to the system administrator uh, because he acted as a quote-unquote consultant. And over the years, we found ways around these limitations by collaborating with many people, including uh, the Swiss MDAT node in Basel, people at the medical faculty, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it's really only about three years ago that we finally got a facility that uh, was up to our expectations. Another problem was to have copies of the databases. Uh, nowadays, it's thought to be trivial. Uh, at the time, we had to rely on very inefficient distribution mechanisms. Uh, nine millimeter tapes, then CDs, um, and uh, towards the end of the 80s, Reinhard Dunz in Basel finally managed to put together a distribution mechanism that uh, was a little more in, 
in keeping with what we could expect rather than just having to rely on solid, ma solid media. But you have to remember that getting access to the databases has been easy, quote unquote, only since there's been a hand high bandwidth internet, which is maybe five years. Um, I'm gonna spend the rest of my time, and as I told you, it was short, to try to, get, to show you a few of the personalities and milestones uh, that we have gone through over the last uh, 20 years. We've been lucky in the sense that uh, we've had people, both scientists and politicians, who have understood even against the backdrop, a general backdrop of obscurantism that there was a real need to develop bioinformatics. And I apologize in advance to those who feel that they should have been mentioned and may not have, there may not be. A um, few of the milestones, of course, the most important to this meeting was SPRISPROT release 1.0, which came out in 1986. Um, Switzerland became host to an MNET node in 1988 at the University of Basel. And actually, Reinhard Dulz, who was the manager of that node, developed some really interesting um, software solutions, and particularly the Hassel protocol, which was really a precursor of today's grid computing. It was a protocol that allowed sharing of databases and applications across a network of computers at the time based on the DECnet protocol. Um, 1989 marked the beginnings of the collaboration you heard of before lunch between Ron and Amos, and which actually created one of the few centers in the world where the, the uh, research activities were completely focused on protein sequence analysis rather than uh, nucleic acids. And uh, you see here the pictures of Reinhardt, and of course Amos, Reinhardt Dulz is here, and Amos and Ron, of course, you, you know quite well. Um, another important milestone was the creation of the first formally declared group in bioinformatics in Switzerland at ISREC with Philipp Bucher, who is here, and Roland Lutti, who unfortunately left us after about two years to go work in industry. And he, is, he was for many years uh, head of uh, bioinformatics at Amgen. Um, some other interesting uh, technological advances. The first version of Swiss model was released in 1991. This was before the web. It was at the time an email server. You could send an email with the parameters of the search you wanted to launch. Um, the first Entree client outside of the US was installed on our premises in 91. And of course, a very big event, which was the uh, inauguration of Exposy that uh, Ron and Amos have already told you quite a bit about. Uh, I think it's important to see that there, there were a number of innovations uh, in the Exposy uh, platform it was one of the very first servers that was offering the possibility to search through databases. Uh, they developed a, a portal called Swiss Shop, which allowed you to um, actually get updates on uh, new annotations and new uh, entries relating to specific protein families. And there was also the integration of a portal concept in the server. These were all for, the for that time, extremely new. Um, 1992, we're still more than uh, 10 years ago, uh, Gaston Bonnet and Steve Benner in Zurich uh, were among the first to use the all against all protein sequence comparison approach. And they used this to derive substitution matrices that are still widely used in biocomputing today. Uh, the Swiss 2D page, um, the database that Ron briefly touched upon this morning was one of the first to actually integrate data from multiple sources and to uh, create a common framework to describe uh, uh, data that had been gathered uh, by multiple labs. Um, Swiss PDB Viewer was a, uh, a pioneering piece of work also in the sense that it integrated both visualization functions and modeling functions and multiple alignment functions in the same uh, user interface. 
Um, in 97, we created uh, one of the early uh, PC clusters that was really put together from scratch uh, and that could do database searches with a very high throughput. Uh, and actually, this uh, was behind some of our web interfaces for a number of years. And uh, lastly, uh, in 98, there was a, a, a huge uh, com uh, computational effort in collaboration with Silicon Graphics in Switzerland uh, to do very large-scale modeling. And this was mentioned a number of times in the press also as being a uh, particularly uh, high-throughput um, uh, project in computing. And here you see Gaston Grenet, Steve Benner, who still for a long time now has gone back to Florida, Nicolas Gay, who is now working for um, GSK in, in the US, and finally Christian Isley, who was one of the people instrumental in uh, developing the, uh, uh, the cluster architecture. One thing that people tend to forget is that Switzerland actually paid, played a very important role in the development of the EBI. Uh, Bernard Hirt, who was the director of ISREC, was also chairman of the EMBN, EMBL Council during the whole period where the, uh, the EBI concept was being uh, developed. And he was in particularly instrumental in uh, guiding the decision as to where the EBI would end up. And I can tell you, because I, I went back to the correspondence that was exchanged about this, I, I asked Bernard for his uh, archives, and the main reason why Hingston was chosen as the location for the EBI at the time is that it was by far the place that had the best internet connections. Uh, while uh, the second site that was seriously considered, which was next to the EMBL in Heidelberg, at the time was very badly connected because Germ Germany was really lagging behind in uh, in network development at the time. The first director of the EBI was Paolo Zanella, who was before that a uh, professor of computer science in Geneva and working at the CERN. And of course, uh, the collaboration with SwissProt from the day one of the EBI was a very important uh, component. And uh, also, when the EBI uh, was started, there was an advisory board formed to try to structure the activities, and there were two Swiss people out of about 10 on the board, Amos Merock, whom you are sitting right here, and Klaus, uh, Klaus Müller. I want to say a few words about how we got uh, to found the SIM. The main driving force, as is often the case for things like this, was where do you find money to fund services? I almost told you a little bit yesterday about the major crisis that erupted in 1996 uh, when an EC grant was uh, uh, denied uh, to Swiss Prot, but there was a previous crisis in 91 which already had created quite a few problems. There were Band-Aid solutions that were put together from all sorts of different sources to keep Swiss Prot going, and this could not go on. So, uh, starting in approximately uh, 95, 96, uh, we really tried to get a consensus emerging among at least the universities of Lausanne and Geneva uh, that such an institute needed to be created. And there was also a push from the federal government that we should to get, put together some kind of institution uh, that they could uh, give funding to. And this finally came to fruition in 1998. Uh, on, at the end of March was actually the cantonal government of Geneva that forced the issue and just got the partners at the table to sign uh, the Foundation Act. And the first Foundation Council met in, in May of that year. Um, and on the 1st of January 2000, we started getting money from the Swiss federal government, which really allowed us to develop the way we are developing today and the way Ernest presented a few days ago. Um, finally, I want to mention a few of the people who really did a lot of work behind the scenes to make sure that all this happens. Robin Offord, of course, uh, who, whom uh, 
Amos mentioned already yesterday, Denis Hochstrasse, who uh, worked hand in hand with Ron for many years, but also was a driving force behind uh, the, uh, the uh, birth of the sieve of Jean Bayo and Jean Trot, and Guy Olivier Segond, whom I'm sure you don't know, who was a politician in Geneva who really forced the issue and uh, got everybody to sit at the, ta at the same table. In Lausanne, uh, we were also lucky to have a strong support from Bernard Hirt. Um, and actually, Bernard managed to get money out at the end of the year. They didn't have enough, enough money left to pay the salaries of the annotators. Um, Lloyd Old uh, in New York, who is the director of the Ludwig Institute, who uh, made it possible for the SIB to really start in earnest in, in Lausanne by providing very generous funding, both for uh, equipment and for salaries. And finally, uh, Daniel Monge at the EPFL, who uh, lobbied very hard for the development of bioinformatics uh, in Lausanne, and who himself did some really distinguished research in bioinspired computing. In Basel, I'd like to mention Thomas Bickel, who was really the person who made the, uh, the MNET node in Basel possible, even though it never got funded by the federal government. Uh, Jan Reto Plattner, who, uh, as a politician and as vice rector of the University of Basel, uh, brought money to Basel to finance the civic activities in that city. Joachim Selig, uh, who made sure that the, national, the Swiss National Science Fund was uh, behind the initiative and Andreas Engel, who uh, participated uh, very strongly in the development. Unfortunately, I didn't have room to put a picture of Andreas here, but this is Tom Bickel, Jan Reto Plattner, and uh, Joachim Selig. Few more people I want to mention. Uh, Charles Kleiber, who is basically a minister of science in Switzerland, who has actually been also behind us for uh, the whole duration of uh, the, the development of the SIB. Jean-Raoul Scherer and uh, Christian Pellegrini in Geneva, uh, who were instrumental in particularly helping Ron's group um, develop. And very importantly, uh, Paul Herling at Novartis and Jonathan Knowles, first at Glaxo and then at Roche, who made sure that we had support from industry. And this is absolutely necessary in a context like Switzerland, where the pharmaceutical industry plays an important role. Um, I learned a few lessons during this, which I'd like to share with you. Um, first of all, a bottom-up approach often works better than top-down. Basically, people who really want something and who have good arguments for doing so can have a lot more influence than a ministry taking a decision. Funding is important. You can't work without funding. But what's more important than funding is enthusiasm and commitment to what you're doing. And a lot of the landmark work that I told about was done kind of outside of normal working hours for a lot of the people who uh, participated in it. And finally, I found out the hard way that uh, once you have a well-funded institute, you have to manage it properly. And that this is a lot of work, and that this is something that's absolutely required, because otherwise your funding and your commitment is going to disappear. And I give a lot of credit to Ernest for really putting in place a professional uh, management structure at the Institute. So these are the people involved, the five founding members of the SIB, and then the group leaders that gradually joined the institution over the years, uh, more or less in chronological order, and of course, Ernest, who is taking a growing place inside the institution. Okay, thanks for your attention. Uh, so do we have questions for Ernest, uh, Victor, pardon? Um, I think the easiest, if, if you're interested in any of, of the aspects I've been talking about, is just to come talk to me, or to Ernest.
just a short thing about pirating software. It's in 82, so, so there's a statute of limitation. So, I mean, I'm not in trouble anymore. But it's true that we did copy every software that was around. But the price of software was much too high for any lab to be able to buy, I mean, with the uh, budget which were allocated for software at that time, which was zero. I think I'm next, huh? Yeah, you're next.